Okay, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Sahana Murthy. I'm a faculty member in the interdisciplinary program in educational technology at IIT Bombay. Uh, it's a relatively new department. We started about five years ago. And uh, it's a department where uh, we, we do two things. One is uh, the people who, it's, it's interdisciplinary. So we have people from engineering, computer science, basic sciences, as well as people from a social science background, primarily education and psychology. Uh, we develop technology tools like uh, tutoring systems or uh, virtual world simulations and all for the purpose of teaching and learning in various domains and also develop uh, pedagogical methods, stra instructional strategies and uh, student centric active learning mm -hmm. techniques to be used along with these technology tools. Um, right now we only have a PhD program. I should have put m the URL of our department but maybe later. So before uh, we start with the uh, core part of today's uh, talk, this session, there's a little bit I'd like to know about you and maybe you've been answering this in all the sessions but I wasn't present so just bear with me. Uh, I just want to know the distribution of your background. So you can just raise your hand, one, two, three, four, five. So are you from an engineering, basic science, humanities, social science or some other background? Just yeah, just pointing your fingers, whether your choice is one, two, three, four, or five. I, I, I don't want exact numbers. I just want a rough distribution. I want to see who's sitting next to whom, whether it's mixed. Uh, okay, just keep it there for a minute, okay? One, three, four. All right. Fine. Because see, for example, let me tell you what all I got from this very quick, uh, very quick exercise. I got that there is a fair distribution, fairly not exactly equal, but a fair representation in all the first four categories. And I didn't actually. I had a slight idea because uh, Professor Sundar had told us last a uh, couple of days ago who all are here, and one of my uh, one of our PhD students, uh, she knew people from her college who are coming here. And she said that there are people who teach business communication and who are from the humanities and social sciences. And I wouldn't have known before that. So an, a quick exercise like this gives an idea of who's there in the class. Couple of more like this. They may be, they may have smaller. So yeah, uh, this is a course for coordinators. We know that. But do you plan to teach? Are you teaching or do you plan to teach? Yes? How many knows? Okay, there are a few people who don't teach also. But there are people in your college who will teach this course. And you will go to them with the takeaways from this session. Yeah? Okay. Uh, last question. In your professional work, uh, do you need to talk about your research? Just say yes, no, I, I want to see how many. Yes. One, two, threes. Yes, one. No, no, one, two, three. <coughs> One. One is you have to talk about research often, two is sometimes, three is not at all. Two, 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 one, two, three. There are some threes. Okay, great, thanks. So it looks like mostly ones and twos. And the reason, again, I'd like to know all of this is uh, this is a really odd course in some sense, you know, it's about technical communication, so who are you going to teach? Most likely engineering students. Who are we teaching? It's teachers who will teach engineering students, but they're from a different background. It may also be useful for your own research, so knowing the context is a little useful here. Okay, so uh, let's look at two scenarios, and it's good if you have some paper and pencil in front of you right now. Yeah, just. Uh, in a, so this session is going to be useful, I just said this, if you teach or plan to teach a communications course or uh, if you found that you have to talk about your research. So if you're in one or both categories, it will be useful for you. And hopefully uh, people will belong to one of these. The other place where it will be useful is if you need to mentor students for their careers. So you know some student might come to you and say, I'm appearing for a job interview tomorrow. Or uh, you may have to coach students through uh, some projects uh, for their future careers. So this session, in fact, this entire workshop will be useful for you even from that perspective. And in our role as teachers, I think all of us 
sometime or the other have to do, have, uh, do fall into this category. OK, so here is a scenario. So consider that your student now, your student is appearing for a job interview. And a typical question that the interviewer asks a student is, uh, tell me about yourself. It's a very standard opening <coughs> statement in an interview. And usually, the students have one minute to answer. So just jot down a few points that you would advise your students to say. Jot it down and keep it with you. We won't do much about it right now. OK, if you're done with that, a very similar scenario. And we'll be taking what you wrote and refining it and over the course of this session. Uh, so imagine now you're in the other role. You are attending a research conference. And you have to talk about your uh, poster. I mean, uh, maybe you're giving a presentation, or there is a poster, and you have to talk about your research. Or you meet a senior colleague who says, so what are you working on? It's a dreaded question of all researchers, because you have to, it's, it's, it's also a very powerful and excellent question. But you have one minute to give a coherent response. And before the one minute is up, the senior member will go get chai and will lose interest. OK, so what will you say at that point? So assume the senior member is in your broad field, but you don't exactly know who he or she is. Now, they may not be in your subspeciality, but it's a broad research conference in your field. Again, two to three sentences, 50 to 100 words, no more. So it's not very easy. OK, so if you have a few points here, what you all just did in either the first or the second scenario was create what's called the elevator pitch. OK, so the answer to any of the such questions, tell me about yourself. What are you working on? Uh, let's introduce ourselves. You may be at some professional professional social meeting. Maybe you're sitting around a table in some, during some business lunch. Uh, or what's your research about? Or for your students, a more formal uh, situation where they're interviewing. Such questions will be asked. And your students and you have to, be, have to be prepared with such answers. So why is this called an elevator pitch, and what, is it, what does it really mean? Uh, let's look at this, OK? So th this is a f one formal definition. I believe it's from Wikipedia. It's a short summary, and it's used to define either a person or a product or an organization, an event, along with its value proposition. So we'll come back to what's meant by a value proposition. It's called an elevator pitch because uh, it's a little lighthearted there. You meet somebody in an elevator on the ground floor, and by the time the elevator reaches the top floor, you should be able to deliver your pitch. And that span is 30 seconds, usually. Sometimes, very rarely, if you are in you know, some towers in South Bombay, it may be two minutes. But Two minutes is also a bit too much there. OK, a um, little more about this. So who all should create an elevator pitch? Uh, I think this is something we already discussed. If you have to present your research at a conference, if your students are going for a job interview, uh, any of you are enrolled for a PhD? Few of you are. So as PhD research scholars, it's very important to develop this pitch. Because as PhD research scholars, you often have to talk about this in various settings. And obviously, many times you have to talk an hour about this, sometimes half an hour. But you will find your several opportunities and several places where you have to be able to say, my PhD is about. And there goes your elevator pitch. Uh, and the uh, introducing yourself and so on. Okay. So uh, for, especially for PhD students, and even otherwise, uh, just go take a look at this. I've just put a screenshot here. There are several contests for PhD students called two-minute thesis or three-minute thesis, where they're supposed to either talk about or create a video or some presentation on their PhD in three minutes. It's a lot of fun. And you get to learn about a number of fields in this manner. Uh, there is a, there's a whole culture. It's called PhD comics. You may, be, you may have seen it, some of you. So uh, the PhD comic strip also, uh, that uh, group also had uh, advertised for a 
an elevator pitch. And I believe in IIT Bombay last year, the Research Scholars Forum was planning to do it, right? Did it happen? Not yet, OK. So why should you care to make this elevator pitch? Main point is you have only one chance to make a good first impression. And what is meant by a value proposition that was there on an earlier slide is that you have to sum up what is so unique about yourself and your work. You have to make the other person care about your work. You have to excite the other person. And clearly, this is one of the key communication skills. That in a short time, how do you say something that so it began in uh, mostly in the business world, where people had to sell an idea or a product. So initially, in the academic world, people were, were saying things like, oh, well, you know, these are things that uh, that's done in industry and in the business world. But the moment you think about the research, you have to always be able to sell your research. And by sell, I mean you have to get other people excited about your research, including the lay public, because we are using taxpayer money to do our research. So it has importance. It has value in both industry settings as well as academic settings. And your students are going to go into both places. So uh, I'm going to skip over this. So let's do an activity at this point. So I'm going to show text here. Later, we'll do some videos. I'm going to show text of two elevator pitches, one example on the left and one on the right. And I'd like you to first, again, do a voting after you read it on which you think is better, OK? In, in whatever way you define better. And this time, instead of giving out your answers 1, 2, and 3 here, one and uh, no, both are equally good, OK? Instead of giving your answers here, I'd like you to vote right, put your finger right in front of you. Because at one level, I, I, I don't want anybody else to see your answers initially, and then you can talk and so on. Yeah, I'll tell you when to put up your hands. It, it, it'll require a few minutes, a few, maybe 30 seconds of reading. So is the activity clear? Yeah, just read through it and judge what you think is better. OK. Ready to vote? OK. One, two, three. Let's see your vote. The only thing here is you can't abstain. There's no right or wrong answer, really, for many of these questions. But you have to say something. So this entire row seems to be OK. Now people are. OK, so it looks like a large majority of you are saying two. I saw a few people saying three. and. I didn't see any one. So one. Some people said one. OK, do one thing. Uh, do two things here. Uh, firstly, you can now start talking to your neighbor. And what I'd like you to do, and I'm going to write this down, is why you think what, whatever you saw, one or two, whichever you thought was better, why do you think that's better? What were features in it that made it better? So talk to your neighbor. Uh, firstly, check if you and your neighbor had a different answer. There were, there were very few the places where I saw discrepancy between neighbors. If there is a discrepancy, resolve it. OK, so uh, let's, looks like there was some lively discussion here. Let me just hear what you're saying. You can just uh, say one by one. And uh, yeah, let, let, wait till the mic comes to you. Say one point, and then we'll give somebody else a chance. And the mic might come back to you. So just say one point. Firstly, say which one you thought was better, and one point as to why. Yes, please. Uh, second one is better. Uh -huh. And uh, point is, in first sentence, hmm? he, what is his expertise, what he learned in an expertise form. OK, so? Uh, in second, he says that what he applied that particular knowledge in the college itself. And third one, he is ready one, to one, apply. One, 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 one by one. Let's just, okay. one point. Your first point was, this particular elevator pitch starts yeah. with the expertise of the students. So let's hear, why, why is it so important? What makes this good? OK, they talk about their expertise. So what? It shows confidence. It shows confidence and OK? It's very precise. That's what somebody said. It's very precise and to the point that it's focused. 
So let, let's just write a few of these ones. So this is focused. So a good elevator pitch is focused. It is uh, precise. What about the impression? In the very first sentence, the key unique point that this person wanted to project, project is a much better word than sell. I was going to say sell, but wanted to project about themselves is there. OK, uh, so good. Ma'am? Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, according to me, the sequence of information is also important. Okay. Like in the first, uh, according to me, second example is the better one. Mm -hmm. Because in first example, uh, the way he started, he or she started is mm -hmm. I graduated from this college. So somebody always graduates from some or the other college. So I'm going to uh, say a couple of more words about this. Everybody has already has graduated from some college or the other. So it's not something very unique, unique or important. More importantly, this information is always there on the resume or CV of every job applicant. Okay. On the other hand, maybe at some point you want to just, let's say the student graduated from some fancy college and they want to throw it in without making a big deal about yourself. See how this person has slipped it in here. Okay. Yeah. That they are saying that no. they are letting the interviewer know that I'm from this college, which information is there, but they're saying what they did there. Okay, other, uh, let's focus a little bit on the parts at the bottom, okay? Why is this important here? Achievement by the person. So what does, so everybody has achievements? Okay, let's Hello? see one. First person, he has made a plan to do something else and next he Okay, so there are two points you're making, both are important. First, let's look at the last sentence. This is what the listener cares about because the student is telling the listener, this is what I can provide you. And the evidence that he or she can do it in the next few years is there in the previous sentence. Okay, good. I think this discussion brings out all the key features that are necessary in the elevator pitch. Uh, I have a summary slide here and uh, let, let me just put this up. I think most of your points are here. If not, I'll add a few more. So a good elevator pitch, the vision is one point, uh, it may ch yeah, the vision of what the person wants to do in the next coming months or years for the organization is clear. You can use the word vision, usually when we think of vision, we think of something big and broad, but for a person, sure. Yeah. Saying that uh, what I'm going to do for you actually, yeah. that is more important exactly. than that actually. That's exactly. the last paragraph exactly. it is telling yeah. about. Yeah. So he's having uh, something else. The interviewer will expect something, oh, he's going to do something for me. Okay, so taking, yeah. There is a question uh, usually in HR interview. Why should we hire you? Why should we hire you or how do you fit in our company? These two are common questions. So now with this elevator pitch, it opens up, see, an elevator pitch actually should set the stage and set the tone for further conversation, further discussion. It's really to get the listener interested in what I'm doing. So with the second elevator pitch, the listener wants to ask more. Oh, OK, you've done this tool in Facebook. Tell me more about it. That's where the conversation is going to go. And the moment I'm asked about, tell me what you did for Facebook, I'm in my comfort zone because this is about my project. So I have steered the conversation into, about my strengths, but it's come there because the interviewer wants to know what I can do for them. Okay, so there are all these points. Yeah. Ah, let's take last line. Yes, so actually let's look at this one also. The last line here is very general as you mentioned. So which student does not want to do anything interesting? Okay, and if a student, so it, it is a good thing. We clearly are looking for Actually, the point you make is right. We are looking for somebody who wants to use his or her skills and who wants to move to an interesting platform. Definitely, we are looking for such people. But saying that I want to use my skills is not going to give that impression. The next question will be, okay, what will you do with your skills? What do you mean by interesting? As of now, you haven't exactly told what your skills are. Right. Uh, somewhere, th that's another point. Look at the difference between this sentence, I've spent last three years in market research. What were you doing in that company? 
That's the question. You have spent, you, you have experience, I agree, but in what? Whereas the second person has sa said something very similar through three years of market research experience, but specifically in research design, modeling, and so on. So, so this is really how to take most of us start from somewhere here because this is really what we want to say. But each sentence is being illustrated with specific examples uh, which are unique to that person in the second example. So it's more of a show rather than telling. First person is saying, I want to do something interesting. Second person is showing what is meant by interesting. Okay? Yeah, one last comment, then we'll move uh, on. In the example two, yeah. Like marketing programs generally will not be prepared for non-profit organizations. Okay. So? So like in above points really is giving his strength. Yeah. But the one, second one, if he is trying to talk to a job interviewer. Right, right. So interviewer, job interviewer, if it is only non-profit organization, then... Uh, it's so I'm assuming that yeah. the, the company he or she is interviewing for is a non-profit organization. Otherwise, they wouldn't say that. But, but generally, marketing programs will not it be It might there. not. But see, again, if a person with an analytical marketing background goes to a non-profit organization and says, I want to work there, this person is really unique. I mean, this has to be valid. This has to be true, okay, to... Uh, okay, one last comment from the back. There. Actually, it's not a comment, actually. It's uh -huh. a supplement. Yeah. Uh, that when he, when he is saying that marketing program... Uh, for non-profit organization, mm -hmm. that may include so many things like branding, promotion of the non-profit organizations, their works. So there ah, they okay. can add values. So, I, I mean, I, I understood the previous comment that no non-profit organizations also need marketing. They need to go get um, people to support them. Yeah, funding. They need to, to sustain. They need so to sustain. So marketing is thought of broadly in that sense. It's not about selling any product, but about their image or what they do and so on. Okay, so uh, let's look at these points and then I want you to look back at a couple of more examples. So, you know, one way to do this is look at your own elevator pitches that you wrote in the first scenario. Just make a quick check about if you have all these points. If not, think about which point you may want to add related to this. Have you explained what you are doing and more importantly, why? Do you have some unique thing in your pitch? What is the hook? It's not exactly a long list of criteria. It's sort of a loose checklist. See if you have some of these points. Later, maybe in the homework, you can refine it. Does anybody want to share any new point they added? One new point, yes? Do not have enough time, so uh, we should be uh, more direct okay. in answering. Right. Right? Right. Yeah. So uh, I just want to bring to your notice one point. The two examples that you saw, they were almost the same length. Word count, it was not exactly the same. The one on the left was 47 words and the one on the right was 51. Okay, so it was more, but it was nearly the same. So it's not that when you say something, but, but still the second one looked very dense. You got a lot more focused information. Okay, uh, is there any point, any interesting point somebody added? You don't have to, just if you think some, you added some new point based on this, yeah. Ma'am, one difference I've noticed is in the two speeches is, huh. the second one is started from most recent one. Okay. And the people are um, basically interested in what recently you are doing, then telling about what you have done, done before five years back. For the so, most part, yes. For the most part, okay. Uh, you're right, especially you don't want to go chronologically. Uh, this is important. This, we see this a lot with novice students, BTECs who come to interview and even people who come to our PhD program. So if we say, tell me about your background, they say, uh, I went to kindergarten, I was, a, you know, my father was in the army, so I went to school in this place, then I went to college there, they give a chronological view. So it's a good idea to caution students that that is not what people are looking for. And it goes, it ties to your point that uh, it's not what happened 20 years ago or maybe even five years ago. The recent thing is more important. However, if there is something key that was done five years ago and as your experience grows, that might happen. So let's say you're 50 years old and you want to change jobs. And when you were 30, you had a PhD. The job requires or PhD is sort of important for the job. Even though it happened 
decade ago, it's an important thing it needs to come in. All right. Ma'am, I had just one point. Ah. One more point uh, they can add is hmm. describing one personality using three adjectives. Okay. And in that case, uh, loyal and active like this, uh, he has to describe his personality, the last line. Is one way of writing uh, okay. this so thing. So the suggestion here is use first, I am going to add one more sentence to what you said. It's a good yes. idea. Think of what describes you. Maybe you are industrious, maybe you are a loyal person, maybe you have a lot of energy. First you have to think a lot, you have to reflect and see which adjective really describes you. But then come up with one example, maybe four words or a phrase that actually shows your loyalty. My friends think I am loyal because I did this. I have been known to be highly energetic because in the college I did A, B, C, D, A, E, F, G. So illustrating the adjective that you want to describe about yourself through an example it works more, uh, is more effective. Ma'am, uh, I had just one point. Well, Ma'am, here. here yeah. uh, in the first example, it looks like uh, the student is in search of the job or the organization, but in the second it looks like organization is in search of this kind of So person. that goes back to the value proposition yeah. that the person can project and give to the organization. Actually both are true in both cases. The interviewer is also looking for a good person and the student is also looking for a job. Uh, let me show you one more example, let's not do any, uh, now that we know what is a good elevator pitch, we all agree. Uh, this has to do with research and especially if you are doing your PhD or uh, if you are guiding students, mentoring students, this would be quite useful. So just read the two okay? and we'll do a short discussion here. So this is more detailed than the previous one, both have details. So simply saying that the elevator pitch must have details is not sufficient because in some way in this one, the first one seems to be a little more detailed than the second one, whereas in numbers and, numbers and all are there. So the detail part by itself doesn't you know, make or break a good elevator pitch. But what I want you to think about is uh, who is center, who is the central actor in the first one and in the second one? Second one is easier who or what is the central actor, the PhD work and how the person has done the work. The first one is kind of going all over the place in some sense. So I, while it's important to give acknowledgement, it is very important to give acknowledgement to your guide, to your institute, to the technical RA who has helped, they are not the central people or central actors in the elevator pitch. So the first one, it almost seems like this person is telling her guide story starts by this is what my guide is doing, my guide has this project, my institute has this facility and I am working in it. It is a very typical thing for novice PhD students to have this mindset. But once the student starts taking ownership of her work, it becomes her work and even though she is working in a larger project with, uh, with a guide, she could not have done this project without the technical RA's help. So there is due acknowledgement given there. But there are also irrelevant details here. I mean, this technical area went on to do ME. Who cares? Um, now, the fact that she has a, a background in electrical engineering was important. So she wanted to say that I have a strong background in electrical engineering, hence I can create teaching interventions for electrical engineering. But here it's being stated, here that background, the importance of that background is being brought up. So it's not just, it's not a mere play on words, it's also why you want to give certain information. So when she wrote this at some point four, three or four years ago, I asked her, why are you telling me about this last sentence? You know, why should somebody care? She said, no, look, I want to tell people I am a double E, you know, I'm not, uh, I have a double E background and I come from a strong double E background. I'm like, okay, let's put that in. Any other comments? One or two comments about this one? I showed you this because uh, if you're in the research field as opposed to the other one, you know, something like this may be useful. There are a lot of examples if you look for elevator pitches for research or elevator pitches for engineering students, you'll, you'll find a lot of examples. I'll show you one or two later. Other comments, uh, questions, 
Yes. Make up focus on. I have not completed my EE only or the degree of electrical engineering. It's time to say, I'm using my electrical engineering degree in application or uh, bringing it in application for the use of the or for the betterment of the society. Yeah. So in comparison of first, it maybe. Right. Yeah. Maybe five years later, her first sentence will change. She won't say, I have a PhD because it's kind of. No, it's done. She'll talk more about her work. At this point, she needed, this was in a conference. She needed to tell, she was looking for some postdoc positions. She needed to tell people that I am doing my PhD, I'm about to finish my PhD, and this is my work. So the PhD part, even though it's something that's there in her CV, it was important for her in the introduction. So another point here is that the elevator pitch evolves. It doesn't stay static. No, as the, uh, it evolves in time and it also depends on the context. Okay, um, so let's do one uh, example. Uh, here is some student's elevator pitch. I'll tell you what to do. So we'll do an activity called Think, Pair, Share. The main goal is that you need to strengthen this elevator pitch. But we'll do it in phases. In the first phase, individually, uh, do you think this elevator point is uh, elevator pitch is strong or weak? Write down one strong and one weak point. Okay, do this. I'll just put all the three phases and you can work on it. I would say about two minutes or so for this. Once you're done with this, pair with your neighbor. So the first two minutes work individually. Uh, pair with your neighbor after that and come up with two ways to help your help the student. This is your student who's come to you. Help your student revise her pitch. And finally, we'll do some. Uh, full class discussion on the main change that we want to advise the student. So about two minutes for the first and five minutes for the second. As soon as you're done writing one strong and one weak point, pair up and start talking. See, uh, this, t this elevator pitch does have some strong points. Somebody asked there, what does it mean? It's not a terrible one. There are some things that the student has done well. So, which, so it's good to identify those and then also point out rooms to improve. So now you can start talking with each other. Okay, so let's see if you want to share. I'm sure you have come up with several things to advise your student. List them in some hierarchy, okay, in your mind or on your paper. What is the main thing? What is one interesting main thing? What? And not just, oh, she should do this and not that. But try to give her some very specific feedback. So let's see what ideas you have. Okay, yes. Can you make it like this? I am fourth year undergrad student mm -hmm. in environmental science and engineering. I did my final year project uh, in the topic of water pollution and chemicals. I am looking for a position that will allow me to do research in your esteemed organization. Okay, let's. They, it is not needed to put the word use my communication okay, skills. Let's discuss this a little bit, okay? There are some, again, getting the student to say that. There are some strong things and some weak things. So it's similar to what you are saying that's here, except the last part, right? The last is, uh, last uh, couple of sentences. Use my communication skill should not be there. OK. So the first two sentences, which you seem to have mentioned, are similar to what's here. So do people agree that there is something OK? N doesn't have to be terrible, but there's something OK about the first sentence. What is good about? OK, you can. So one change I'm hearing. One change I'm hearing is that the student can shorten it. She's saying the same thing in too many words. So the content, OK, the content that's here can be shortened. The student can say this way. One second, one by one, huh? let's see. I'm an expertise in the water pollution and chemical as my final year project is on that. I'm looking for a place where I could prove myself. I'm going to steer the discussion in a slightly different direction. See, uh, let's actually talk about the weak point here. What's the key weak point in this elevator pitch? He is asking uh, uh, from the companies to create an opportunity for his uh, area, actually. So he is not supposed to ask in this manner. What so this are, is the weak what point. What is the student to, supposed to do instead? Uh, instead, uh, like, uh, my focus area is this one. And uh, I can able to work in this particular so this manner. This is, there is a point that he's mentioning that here, the student is not 
the student seems to be very generic and open and is putting the onus on the company saying give me a job yeah you have to start i am looking for a position okay you should not explain that i am a fourth year graduate okay, let's and do one thing. exact format what should be the starting point how should be the phrasing and all actually some of it is a matter of personal choice let's talk a little bit more about the content in this not just the style and the format what is missing here yes please madam ma'am the uh, repetition part is the negative part of this because the first two sentences and the last two sentences are saying almost the same thing the strong point is that she has put forward that she wants to do further research okay and uh, i i would suggest that uh, uh, she should be more concise and um, she should uh, this is just a, a, a way of doing it as my final year project for uh, this uh, environmental sciences and engineering i worked on water pollution and chemicals and there is a lot of scope for productive work in this project and i'm looking forward for an organization that's going to let me work more on this as okay. it has a lot of scope okay yeah. so i'm going to make one suggestion here okay uh, for you to continue uh, all these phrases i'm looking for a position that allows so try to be a little more specific like in the sure. examples that you saw earlier and i'm going to show you one example i'm not saying what is on the next slide is the best and you can have quibbles with that but look at the it, it's more about saying things like i want to use my skills or i want to work for your organization i want to use uh, my training more than that this is a little longer i agree but she's put in a lot more content here there are there may be problems with this one also other kinds of problems but why is the second line first line is the same why is the second line i found it more interesting uh, personally me why I mean I'm interested in it Sundar is interested in it I'm not sure about you It focus it talks about Pawai Lake and IITB which we face we see problems of it every single day So the thing is this person has done some homework about the company So we are kind of moving to a next stage that's why I said the previous one is not terrible but it's good to know what the company is really looking for Some She knows. Okay, power lake water hyacinth is a big problem. I can fit well because my project was on that. That's one thing. Um, the one point which was missing in the in this one, but it was there in the earlier examples, was what specifically the person can do for the organization. So eventually, she wants to develop something. So try to get your students to think about what they can take into it. Yes, everybody has great skills. Everybody is interesting. They work hard and all. But how can they translate that for themselves? So the, uh, another way of saying it is, let's say you have two students. Both have graduated from the same university, same department. Their elevator pitches should look different. This one is too generic. two students from that department same year both of them will write something i will then write something very similar so try to make it the uniqueness aspect is what's missing here okay let's move on a little bit um, we can talk about this till and your next session dr lena jha also will talk will tell you a little more about how to present yourself in such situations yeah can we apply to different companies yeah like i'm a novice yeah. i'm just a fresh pass out yeah and then uh, because my project was related to say particular right i am from electrical background right. so i might be applying to for a maintenance job right. i might Agreed. be a design job right so every time i have to develop a new elevator pitch so or object so this is a very interesting question uh, let's so what the experts recommend here okay the part about let's look at this slide let's look at which parts here stay the same and which parts might change when you apply in different contexts so explain what you do and why why is and why is it important <laughs> this is about yourself your uniqueness your selling you know, your unique selling point the it won't change drastically because in your 20 years or 40 years there are a few unique things you have done so there are the, the parts which are core about yourself may stay the same on the other hand what do you want the listener to remember what can you offer the listener 
you're making a bridge between what yes. you have, what you can, and what they want, or what you think they want at this stage. So that may need to change. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. We will need to change them because simply because uh, we are looking for a different prospect. We need some uh, something more from life. We need need something more out of work, and that is why we have to present a different elevator pitch whenever we apply. I think uh, three to four years, five years down the lane, it should change. Not drastically, as she said. Not drastically. Same time in this, uh, you know, this month, if I'm applying for four companies, even that would change. I th what I would say is that the perspective would change. The core content of what you have done will be the same. But the way, you know, why is it important to the listener? That question you have to change. Yes. MCA, and now he's applying for a job in a company, and he's applying for a job as a faculty position in. in very different. It's a completely That's different. That's very different. So but what she said is fourth year student applying one for a design job, one for a maintenance job, even there. So that Good. means elevator pitch may change according yeah. to the... Good question, yeah. Okay, so let's, if you have to now come up with some heuristic or guidelines really, these are loose guidelines about how to create it or how to help your students create it. So, oh, the first point is exactly related to your question. Decide what's the purpose of the elevator pitch. Is it to introduce your research? Is it a job interview? Is it uh, to start you know, your own startup, consultancy and so on? Once you have decided, uh, you have to, this is hard, you have to decide what is your engaging hook, what's your selling point, and give you one or two examples later. This has to be something, th uh, in this example, I think the engaging hook was, I analyzed how chemicals relate to the growth of water hyacinth, because it's such a big problem here. We all care about it deeply, and somebody says, oh, I've solved it, or I've worked on it. That's the hook. Uh, this is practical but important. Write it. 50 to 200 is the range I've seen. 100 is somewhere in the middle. Three to four sentences. Then practice it, practice it, practice it in front of a mirror, in front of a wall, your friends, your mother, your colleagues, strangers. It, you'll, the more you practice, you'll just get confident. That's the main reason. Uh, again, this time limit is about a minute, and this is about 100 words. So you. Try to balance those two. Uh, this one, the, what the last one means, uh, device multi-resolution elevator pitch. So look at this cartoon here. If you can't read it, it says, I've got an elevator pitch, an escalator pitch, and just to be safe, a stairway pitch. What's different in the three? L length, time. So it's good to have a 30 second, two sentence statement. It's good to have a three-minute statement. As a PhD student, you also need a 15-minute talk or, and a one-hour talk. You need, so it's good to have it, but it will gradually develop. My, I mean, when you're advising your students, let them start with one good one, and then you make them practice in different uh, situ situations how it works. Uh, for research, here are just some tips, OK? I'm just going to state them. You can use them. Uh, if, this is specifically if you're talking about research, because most science and engineering research are abstract and esoteric, and if you're telling, it, it should be something that if you meet your aunt or grandmother, they should care about it. You should be able to explain it to them. Of course, the elevator pitch to your grandmother might be different than the elevator pitch to, in a conference, but you have to develop the skill. So the way it works is, if you state the problem that needs to be solved or that you are solving, people are always interested in common problems. So see if your problem can be related to real life scenario or something larger. Don't, this doesn't have to be done too much because then it gets fluffy and thin. But topics like power, climate, food, education, disease, everybody is interested in one of these topics. You know, they, it's, it's what as human beings, we care about. So if you make five jumps, where do you connect to? This is important, not so much in a research conference. In a research conference, everybody knows the field. But let's say you're giving a public talk. But still, it's a good idea to have uh, some connection, especially if you're 
going cross department. So when I meet my colleague from some other department, these are the common areas that we both understand. And if my colleague starts from one of these and then jumps to his research, I'm more likely to listen. So I'm, you have to take this with a little bit of caution because I've seen some people who kind of talk very big and large and then you don't know what the substance is. That's the other extreme. But it's good to keep these in mind. Then the last one, I actually found this in some uh, one biology professor. He was uh, advising this. He said, start, tell something counterintuitive or unexpected about your research. So his example is, do you know that blind people also gesture? I think he was a psychologist studying vision and perception. Do you know that blind people also gesture even when one blind person is talking to another blind person on the phone? So you'll say, why does a blind person need to gesture? That too on a phone, where did it? So that's the hook. See if you can connect your research to something of this nature. So this person was doing research on perception and gestures and vision and so on. So it was a good, it was something useful to this. So let me show you a couple of examples. So how, uh, more about how. So elevator pitch doesn't have to be only written. You can create a presentation. So what we have our PhD students do is create a screencast, which is a voice, a narration, plus screen capture. There are a lot of software available. Uh, it's there on the next page. I'll come back to the previous page. Or many of these, Jing allows you to create five minute pitches free of cost. It's a two minute download. Um, you can, it's, it's very easy to operate, many of these. And the moment you have visuals and pictures as well as voice, there is a mo there's a personalization. So you can always create it, tell your students to put it on their mobile phone or some uh, device. Everybody carries them. And you can show your research, 30 second clips, no more than that. Uh, all of these have very easy to follow tutorials. Some of them are paid. So Camtasia and Cam Studio, if you want the full version, it's paid and it's a little costly. Your college may want to purchase it. But to create small, the first two I believe are, uh, the first one I've used, second one also one of my students has used. So let me show you a couple of examples. Arthritis is a very common disease and progresses with age, but what most people don't realize is that arthritis is more common than heart disease, more common than diabetes, and more common than all the cancers put together. We are trying to coax stem cells to regrow the lost cartilage inside osteoarthritic knees. If we are successful, this will be the first time, the first treatment ever to change the progression of this chronic disease. Very broad, but sometimes you do need very broad pitches. Did, did you get the first sentence? He says that arthritis is more common than heart disease, diabetes. So that's the hook. When we think of what are the more common diseases, we think Heart, attack, heart disease is sort of, we hear about it all the time, cancer. But this guy starts by saying, no, it's arthritis. And then you, know, you want to know what they have done to, uh, to address it. So this institute, okay, it's an organization that does work in stem cells. They had a contest where all senior, some 30 senior professors were asked to create elevator pitches for their own labs. And they went and created it. So most of them are like this. It's 30 second clips of the person speaking. Okay, so this is one way your, your, your students can do something like that. Go take a look, whichever ones you like, you can simply mimic them. The other example, let me tell you what this is. So this was a conference and the person, this is only a screencast and narration. The person who's speaking, first person couple, he's our, uh, he was a PhD student. I mean, he's still our PhD student. At this time, uh, this year, I think uh, he was in his second or third year, I don't remember. So he had to give, what we had done in the conference was that every speaker had to create a 30 second clip. And then our team here just put all of it together. We called them teasers. And then we played a 20 minute movie at the beginning of the conference so that the audience got, a, got an overview of the entire conference. So this is couples elevator pitch. And what I want you to pay attention to here is the examples he gives in the beginning. 3D visualization skills are important in the various fields. Here is one engineering drawing task. Given a top and side view of an object, can you visualize an object in 3D? Most people imagine this. 
Some might imagine this, and someone might also imagine this. This means that different people have different visualization skills, and it can be improved using Blender. Let me just stop there. So, what was his what was his talk on? Can you get from here? <coughs> Improving 3D visualization skills in engineering drawing, and how did he do it? Came in the last five seconds. He created this is a software Blender. It's a three, open source 3D software. So he had created some training program with it. That was all he wanted to tell the audience at that point. So for 30 second clips, you it has to be at this broad level. It can't be anything. Uh, more detailed than this. OK, any questions at this point? So I, there is one more activity. Uh, do you want to create an out, your own elevator pitch? Are you interested in having some rough outline? You want to start at least? Some yeses, one no, and so. OK, let's do one thing. Let's get, do, let's work on it for about a short time and then uh, there is a full blown homework where you can do it later. Why it's good to do it here in when others are there is you'll get a lot of ideas okay, and feedback about your own pitch. So again, let's you can do this as a think pair share and what you can start with what you had earlier. The first uh, scenario, pick any one of these, don't pick both. So either you have to introduce your research at a conference, the other attendees are in your broad field, but they don't know your specific research subfield. Or you're up, you personally are applying for a job at a new college. You don't like this college. Don't tell your principal I said that. Uh, but for some reason, you know, there's a better opening and you, have to, you want to teach business communication or technical communication or something else. So individually write. Write down those 100 words. You can take what you had earlier, and you can refine it based on the good features that we discussed. The unique point, the specific details, writing something which makes the listener care. Then pair with your neighbor and uh, give each other feedback. And if you want, one or two samples we can see. Spend a little bit time refining yours. This is, it's a, difficult exercise okay we made all our students do it then my colleague and i realized we had to do our own and it was really painful but it was a good exercise because each time we have to introduce our department our pitches were more like our department pitches so it's really worth spending 10 minutes or so working on this I have uh, just picked one, it's just one that I liked. We'll do two examples. One is this, one more, but you do, you're not allowed to read out your own. You have to, if you like your neighbors, you can nominate it and read it. Just look at your neighbors and I'll just randomly choose, okay? We don't have much time, that's why. I'm sure all of you have really good ones. Look at what your neighbor has written, if you like that, if you feel that there, and not just if you like, you have to say what you like about it. So here is one. Most people who purchase pro you listen? Yeah. yeah. Most people who uh, purchase mobile products uh, go through online reviews before they purchase it. It is difficult for them to study all reviews as it is time consuming. We have developed an algorithm which gets user specifications and, accor and accordingly our system will generate results which gives optimal solution to the end user. So if you don't get the exact, I, I didn't say it very well either. The problem is, or the context, the interesting context is first stated that people go through, have to go through a lot of reviews. It's time consuming, problem is stated. It's common. Most of us, when we are buying a product, we have to read 16 reviews. What you want is some, you, you want somebody to give you reviews, that's what they have done, which are tailored to you. Okay. Something like this. Okay, other, uh, one more example, and then we can conclude after that. If you, you have to read your neighbors. You can't read your own. <laughs> yeah, you, your neighbor has to analyze it and see that, say why they like it, not just that. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, please. Shall be reading the 
a pitch which is written for presenting a research in the conference okay there's one from, example there this is from uh, my neighbor hiran patel the pitch is like this facebook and twitter nowadays need no introduction more technically they are the examples of huge data sharing on the cloud you would not like to like someone to change your tweet or delete your personal communication with your friend we call it a security loophole uh, we work on the developing data storage security model which assures the user for safety of his or her data so i'm assuming that you have developed some code some some security some model which can ensure the security of your tweets okay. which are publicly available okay thanks see in all these examples what you will see is that uh, what you've seen is that the initial part is something is something which most of us can relate to and are interested in uh, professor sundar here mentioned one important point when you were writing it that the unique the usp or the uniqueness that you have to write in the research pitch should be more about your research it should, it's not about you as a person whereas when students are going for a job interview it's a person who's more important because the person is being hired but academia is really has these very odd rules and uh, more than rules it's these cultural uh, guidelines that we all follow we don't ever say how great i am but you can say that look this research is exciting because so you speak through your research so if you're talking about your research the usp has to be about the research on the other hand for students who are going for interviews it can be about themselves as a person etc okay so uh, what next is uh, so when we will do this course again in the online part of the course and then the december workshop when you'll do it in your college there'll be a home assignment for this session where i just want you to get familiar with it you don't have to do anything where we ask the participants to basically choose a tool and create a video or a screen screencast so if you are interested go look through these links and uh, download some of the software if you are interested you can play with it conclusion your pitch is not static it refines over time uh, it's good to do video projects and the this is really not the last slide the last slide i have is a question nobody asked me questions so i have to ask you questions you know that's the way it works so what were your takeaways from this session just say one thing each word one the word elevator pitch okay what else i could make my own you learned how to start making your own okay how to remain focused how to project myself please how to project yourself how to remain focused how to stay focused okay how to make it crisp okay okay how to be crisp and up to the point okay how to make the learners to understand to know their own elevator pitch how to help them create their own elevator pitch focus on the benefit impress okay you don't the, the goal of the elevator pitch is not necessarily to impress them but to get them interested in your work uh, one more so now i'm taking the discussion in a slightly different point is and this is especially for those who will be teaching this course or who need to teach other people how to teach this course so you may want to include this part this as part of your session maybe compressed one or so so what are takeaways for you not just in terms of content but also in terms of teaching this topic so what will you i mean you see the point of us doing the coordinators workshop here uh, i think uh, professor kannan mentioned it on day 1 that it's not just the content because if it's content we can just give you links or videos it's the pedagogy the learning and uh, the interactivity and also is there anything specific that you would like to use from this session Yeah, not anything vague you can say something like i'm going to use this activity or i'm going to you are going to use exercises okay uh, what i like is uh, the new concept think pair and share think pair share is a very powerful group discussion or classroom discussion to uh, strategy 
I will also put a link to, we have given lots of tutorials on how to do think pair share for domain related and other subjects. I can put a link, it's a long video. And uh, we also created what's called activity constructors. So if you want to create your own think pair share, uh, you can just, it's like a worksheet. You put in your text in it and you're good to go. Some guidelines also on how, how, many, uh, uh, how, how many minutes for each. And similarly, another strategy which really works in a large classroom when you want people to both work on their own as well as bring them out in a group discussion is the voting part. You have to have challenging questions. So the first questions were just for me to get to know you. I'm not talking of those. Those help if you want to get to know, know your students. But something like this one. This question. Uh, in this case, it, the, I mean, I did see one person somewhere there who had said that one is the correct answer. But if you want to get a debate going about something, sometimes you do want people to explore all angles. Give two pitches which are roughly the, at the same level, but both have different strong points and different weak points. Half the people will say, half your students will say one, half your students will say two. And that's a great way to go to the next slide, which is what makes a good elevator pitch. So both these classroom techniques you can use um, in any of your classes. OK, I think our time is up. So I'll uh, be around for the next 15 minutes or so if you have any other questions. And uh, thank you for your lively participation. Thank you.